fucking tell. I can prove how sick they are. Welcome to the mouthpiece, episode thirty-two, year two of the mouthpiece podcast. Today we're going to talk about my New Year's. What's going on with me in poker? A special interview with the one and only Norman Chad. So stay tuned. The mouthpiece is next. Yo, happy new year, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful new year's. Uh, sorry, I wasn't able to have a podcast last week. Uh, my good friend and editor, Danny, decided he was going to take the family to Utah, disappear somewhere in the mountains. How was the mountains there, buddy? Cold. cold. There you go. It was cold. Of course, it's going to be cold. Did you guys, uh, did you, uh, were you in tents? What were you guys, where, 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 hotel, what? Oh, Kevin. Okay. That sounds fun. Yeah, so uh, we let him have a week on and off with the family. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I, uh, my New Year's Eve was uh, pretty fun. Uh, I, I, I've kind of been talking a little bit. I've been struggling a lot with pain, so I decided uh, we got tickets to the party over at the Wynn. Um, it's like a party for real high rollers. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine has a friend of his that loses a lot of money. So he got his tickets to this party, which is, I mean, is real top end stuff. Uh, Kelly Clarkson was the feature performer for the night. Um, so I decided this year, instead of w- the walking, which put me in tremendous pain last year, I, I got me a scooter. Uh, I pulled up to the side valet at the win. My name was on the room. We got a room for the night. Uh, I was all comp to us also. So, we were able to go for uh, to the party, plus uh, a room, and we only had to tip the host five hundred bucks. Can you imagine that? Five hundred bucks for two tickets to Kelly Clarkson, a dinner, and a room, five hundred total. I mean, man, I remember those days when I used to be a baller and used to be able to get everything for next to nothing. But uh, so uh, this was a good deal. Uh, I guess rooms usually on New Year's Eve probably go for a thousand a piece, let alone suites. So uh, we had this beautiful room. I had my scooter, nice party. I was amongst really good friends um, and uh, had a good time. Uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not supposed to drink because of my uh, uh, medical condition and the meds that I'm on, but I decided to have a few drinks. Uh, I said, what the hell, I'll just pay for it in the morning, but... Uh, I ended up paying for it at 4.15 in the morning after I fell asleep in the room at 2.15 and I woke up screaming in pain. Uh, then I was in pain for the next two days because alcohol is in, is an inflammation and when you put inflammation into my fucked up body, then you end up in pain. So it, was, it, was, it wasn't a very good day the next couple days, but doing a little bit better now. Uh, but I had a good time. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, then, uh, so that was, let's see, that was Tuesday night, Wednesday. So I was in pain Wednesday, Thursday, went Friday to the doctor to get some kind of trigger point injections on my back, which was just causing just horrible pain down my leg. So they gave me these injections. Uh, they were sore on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I was pain free. I'm like, Oh, these work well. I'm like, this is great. And so I was in a great mood Sunday, Monday. I was looking for a poker game, but couldn't find one because whenever I'm in no pain, I want to play poker. And uh, then I don't know if I slept wrong or something, but I woke up Tuesday and and I was in this terrible pain again. I'm like, come on, man, this is just fucked up. And the thing is, is, you know, I've ever since I got that spinal cord simulator put in on January 22nd of 2019, it's like it's maybe 85% of my pain go away. So I really haven't played any poker uh, in the last two weeks. They're just, uh, you know, New Year's week. It's very busy. Uh, I didn't have a scooter. It's very hard to walk through all the people. Then you have to wait on the list. And uh, it's just too much for me. So uh, I just I just haven't played any poker the last couple of weeks. Uh, I got a lot of good poker coming up and uh, I'll talk to talk to you guys all about that here in the coming weeks uh, as far as what's going on in the world uh, the world's fucked up 
nothing's changed there. Uh, our media is corrupt as fuck. Nothing's changed there. And um, I try my hardest to not watch it because uh, it just puts you in a bad mood. And uh, it's also one of the reasons, I don't know if you guys have noticed, that you don't see me much on Twitter anymore. I, I did have like a little Twitter spat, I think, on New Year's Day. But I, I just can't, it's just such a negative place. It's like, it's where, it's li- literally where positivity people go to fucking die. I mean, if you want to just be miserable, go on Twitter. If you're in a great mood, you want to be miserable, go on Twitter. If you're already miserable and just want to be more miserable, go on Twitter. So I try not to stay off that. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how this Instagram works. I, uh, I started an Instagram account and uh, so I'm working on that a little bit, but really not doing much so anyways uh also new for 2020 is cameos i've joined cameo.com you know it's like you know somebody's getting engaged they want mike the mouth to say congratulations or someone's getting divorced they want mike the mouth to say congratulations or somebody's just had a baby just it, get well soon they're in a hospital anything that they want me to uplift them because I really believe I'm an uplifting person. Uh, I'd be more than welcome to do. So check it out, cameo.com. Um, a lot of my friends are on it, and they really people really enjoy hearing from people they really like. So I and I enjoy doing those things for my fans. So I hope you enjoy them if you decide to get some cameos. And uh, well, if not, I love you anyways. Have a happy. We'll be right back here on The Mouthpiece. The Mouthpiece. If you'd like to take part in our phone call segment, you can give us a call at 702-329-0480. And if you're a snowflake or a pussy and you don't want to talk to me, you can email me at mouthpiecepodcast at gmail.com. Also, follow me at the Mouth Mattiso on Twitter for times that our call-in segment will be live. Okay, it's time for my favorite time of the show, the phone call segment. It's 2020, and it's a happy new year. Let's see what my fans have to say today. Let's light up the lines. Welcome to the mouthpiece. This is Mike. Doug Polk's a fucking cuck. Trump 2020. <laughs> 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 this is uh, me calling to talk shit about Doug Polk, bro. You know who it is? No, I don't. Fu- who's I, what's your name again, man? I forget. My, my name. My name's Cody. I always call oh, yeah. you and tell you that Doug Polk's a pussy. Yeah, he, <laughs> fucking Doug's Doug, man. He's he's actually chilled out a little bit. He tried he tried to throw out some political shit that he knew nothing about the other day, and he got roasted pretty hard. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, I just think I just think he's broke right now or something. I don't know what's going on. He's been quiet as fuck lately. Yeah, man, what a fucking fucked up world we live in, huh, Cody? And the the literal, literally, literally the brother. left with it, like they sympathize the, with a terrorist that's killed with thousands Iran. of people. Man, they're so they hate Trump. Know, they hate him more than they love our country. I've never seen Buddy, anything. I have a friend. I have a friend that lives in Iran that I speak with every single day. Me too. I have one that. also. Dude, and they, they they literally they're they're in fear for their lives, bro. Literally, literally, my buddy is like, yeah, say two million people showed up for that funeral. He's like, that number is probably half of what really actually showed up. He's like, he's like, no, those people were there by choice. No, no they're forced to be there. Dragged, of course, they're dragged out of their house. Dude. I know that, <laughs> dude. I have a friend who I talk to uh, like three times a week, like on WhatsApp and stuff. And he lives in Iran. He was one of my best friends. And he says, uh-huh. I keep my everything to myself. If you talk anything pol- political against the, the Iran regime, they will come and kill you. You disappear. Listen, they took out a guy. I mean, they, the guy stormed our embassy, tried to kill our people. The guy has done so many, like, Obama wanted to take him out many times. They decided against it. Bush wanted oh, listen, listen, it, right? This guy, but when, this guy killed tens of thousands of his own right, people. Right, of his own people, a literally. Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, he killed about 2,000 people. They were shooting people out of helicopters, sharpshooters on top of buildings, bro. Like, right. 
their own people. Like it was nothing. <laughs> like, Cody. And then, Cody. And then CNN wants to say, I know, dude. Cody, know. listen. They fucking oh shot down a Ukrainian airliner. And Pete Buttigieg got, uh, was on the stump today uh, uh, in Iowa Trump blaming Trump. Trump. <laughs> Hey, blaming fucking Trump. Are you Trump fucking kidding? Down, oh, my God. Anyways, man, what's been going on? How's Trump. poker? I remember Trump 2020, baby. You got it, Cody. Take care, my man. Take it easy, brother. Later. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the mouthpiece. Who's this, man? Hey, hey, this is Frank from Georgia. What's happening, brother? What's up, buddy? How's it going, man? I um I played a couple sessions this week, man. And I was I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, uh, do you? Uh, I know you play, you know, for a living. Um, obviously, I have intentions on making money every time I play, but I guess you could call me recreational because it's not my source of income. Right. But um, I was like super bored the other night. Didn't have shit to do. Sitting in the house, kids, all ladies getting on my nerves. So I go out and I play. <laughs> And I think that was my main mistake, obviously, too, because I was yes. looking for um, entertainment. So uh, instead of, you know, I mean, when, when you're playing no limit hold them, you got to sit there and fold, you know. Yeah. Fold, fold, you gotta fold. You got to fold, 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 and then you have to, uh, it's the best way to put it. Like, no limit hold them is everybody sitting around waiting for the one hand. And that's really what it is. And I'm, you know, and then I'm playing in a juicy home game, and everyone's like straddling and playing every pot. So right. guess what? I start doing the same thing. I lose three buy-ins in like an hour and a half, and mm -hmm. I felt miserable. And I'm thinking, like, you know, I probably should have went to the bar and got drunk or some shit, and well, actually I could have enjoyed myself. But think about I'm think about where you start. Yeah, think about where you started this conversation off. You were at home. The kids and the old lady were aggravating you, so you went to play poker. First of all you're already in a defeated spot because you're going to play in a in a aggra you're already aggravated about something internally and you're not exactly. in, a, in a positive mindset to win at poker you must you know like you said you say I'm going to win all the time I want to win you know I expect to win but when you're in when you're going to go gamble in a negative mindset it's going no matter what you say, it's go, even if you're with the butt, your boys, and you're in a home game. You're it's still when you get there before you have a couple of drinks, you're still going to be thinking about something that aggravated you at home. And when that happens, you're already in a defeated spot where you're not going to have your patience. And listen, I play in games all the time where I, I straddle with them and I flip because I, I, I can't get into the private games unless. I straddle and I and I do flips with them, which I do. But right. you also have to not gamble with that. In other words, yes, do flips, do straddles, but you still need to stay patient and focused. And I, 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 I played horrible. I was embarrassing myself. Like, it, you know, key things that, you know, we do is like, don't call big bets out of position with mediocre hands. And that's right. exactly what I was doing. Just trying to nail flops and shit. Right. And I played horrible. Yeah. It like made me not want to play for a long time. Well, um, listen, we all I'm do really it. Result oriented. Yeah, we all do it. We all have bad days. Uh, and unfortunately, like when, when I play on like even the live streams and then people see me misplay a hand, right? Then all over Twitter, they want to talk about how bad I play, but they don't want to talk about the fact that I would leave the session a $50,000 winner. They only want to talk about is the one hand I play bad. Now, yeah, exactly. there's, there's, there's days that you, we're, we're not, we're, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm not a robot. You know, I'm going to play, misplay hands. Uh, yeah, whether, we're human. Yeah, whether it's I didn't sleep well or something is bothering me. Uh, one thing I've learned to do, uh, and something that's really made me really skyrocket this year, is I used to play because of my job. I used to say I got to play full time. I got to put in the hours. The more hours you play, the more right. more money you're going to win. You know, but luck, luckily I've been very fortunate to be able to play in some really good private games where the games are really big, but I'm, I'm selling half of myself, sometimes 75% of myself, and uh, where you're winning or losing 50, 100,000, but 
you know, if I if I like the last time I played, I I think I won like forty five thousand. I had half of myself. I played ninety minutes, uh, and then the, a good score. Yeah, and the game, and I got lucky. It was I was I didn't even wasn't even planning on playing. I just uh, uh, I, was, <laughs> I was kind of depressed, and uh, 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 my friend came over, and then we got invited to this game. So. I, when I got there, oh yeah, that was on the last oh, yeah, podcast. Yeah, right? yeah, last podcast I talked about it. Yeah, yeah, that and, was a good episode. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Chad's a great guy, one of my close friends, and uh, he's a he's he's a good character person, and uh, I'm glad that uh, we've become friends. It's like uh, sounds like if you could fucking play in that game, everyone would be rich. Yeah, well, if the thing is, is is uh, we he's got a he he sets up a lot of good private games, you know. And now that we're pretty close friends and stuff, he's like, you know. You know, I know you're a good guy. I'll, I, he goes, I, he goes, yeah, I want as many fish as I can, but you know, I'm gonna try my best to get you in as many games as I can. And you know, I appreciate that. I respect his friendship, and you know, that's what you know friends are supposed to do for people. But uh, you know, uh, the thing I've learned o- now over the time, it's it's really not about quant- quali- quantity; it's about quality. If you're always in for the sure. right, when you're playing in the right mindset in games where people. But are you're just way better than them, you know. You're just yeah. There, you know, there's gonna be times you get three out or get unlucky or whatever. You know, most of the time, big pots we run it twice. It's pretty tough to get unlucky if you're you know when you're getting it in a head to get unlucky twice. But uh, right. you know, it's it can happen. You can run. You know, I know you can run bad. I've seen you run bad. But uh, you know, it really is a mindset. Don't get down on yourself, man. Just think about like the mistakes you made, like going to play in a bad mindset, and just don't do it again. In other words, the next time you go to play poker. You, you know, make it be on a day where things are good and your wife and you, no fights and, and you give your kids a kiss good night and, hey, honey, well, I'm going right? to go play a couple hours. She gives you a kiss goodbye. Okay, go ahead and go crush them. Dude, you're always going to win in that spot. You know, I, I know. No, it, you're right, man. I, yeah. Uh, I, I swear to God, I'm not just saying this, man. Like, um, uh, you and uh, Phil Home Youth or whatever, like, uh, I've been watching your podcast for, you know, a couple months or whatever. I now, appreciate and, uh, it. The positivity thing, man, really helps. I've been trying to apply that to just to Dude, do like my daily it's amazing. life and stuff, and it really does help out a lot because I've always been like a negative person, yeah. just like always looking at outcomes, like, well, what if this happens or whatever, and just staying positive and being optimistic, not overly mm-hmm. optimistic to where you're being a sucker, but um, just being positive, it really helps out a lot, yeah. and uh, it makes you happier at the end of the day. Don't get down on yourself. Just... Think about when it, next time you go to play, just think about your mindset. You know what I'm saying? And don't worry about straddling and gamble. That's fine, but don't gamble with them. In other words, give off the impression, throw off a curveball one time, maybe make it whatever, 300 with dog shit. They re raise you and, and then right, show, yeah. show them some dog shit hand and say, oh, I was just joking, right? And then flip them up like the six deuce off or something. And then, 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 the, then, They'll, all they'll remember is the six deuce off, and then the next ten times you have a hand, you'll get paid. So, you know. Uh, True that, brother. Let me ask you a question. Uh, since like you don't sports bet and stuff anymore, man. Uh-huh. Uh, ever since I quit, I don't really gamble much at all anymore. Like mm-hmm. even table games and stuff. Right. Um, I'll tell you what. The value of money, like that, I actually have an appreciation for money now. Me too. And. Um, and I actually have, like, uh, I didn't care about having savings and stuff at one point. Like, I just figured, like, oh, whatever, I'm going to go on a run and make a score. Now it's, like, um, you know how you would straddle 500 or, like, do stupid bets. Or, like, you know, you'd bet, be like, I heard you saying bet 50K on a game. Like, now, like, if you – wouldn't you rather just have 50,000? Buddy, what, I, what, I, what I would do for – what I would do for an extra game? 50 grand in my fucking – bankroll right now you wouldn't even amount i would, couldn't even tell you what i would do dude i was thinking the same thing fuck off danny you would, you would. yeah my, my, my editor is like you probably suck cock for fucking fifty thousand i'm like yeah probably <laughs> you know so uh so he's like he's fucking with me right now but uh no it's like uh listen i, I mean i used to just spend ten thousands like there were dollar bills and uh, listen, everything happens for a reason, and now I'm grounded, and and I still I'm, I'll play in the p- biggest games, and people take pieces of me, and I I still can play at, at a very high level. Um, the bottom line is the reason you know people will say, well, why don't you just play smaller? Well, I, I, this is a rule of thumb: like the higher you play, the better the game. I'd rather play in a really high game and have twenty percent of myself than have to grind in a game that my bankroll is. 
fit for because that game is going to be 10 times better than the game where people are grinding for a living. It just is. It's the yeah, dude. It's like forever. if you if you have to play five ten or ten twenty five, you know, 10, those are some of the it. toughest games in the, the world. The toughest. Right now. There's no what, dude. Nobody's giving away a quarter. They're so tough. But lately, I've been playing a fifty and a hundred with a hundred Annie, and uh, uh, well, a couple of times the game wasn't that good, but a couple of times we had just 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 guys dusting off fifty balls like they were quarters, and uh, right. it doesn't just it just. You know, uh, I, I mean, I got real lucky the last time we played, but I'm, I'm just saying that, and my, I wasn't mentally ready to play, but I was in a good, uh, you know, my friend, you know, Chad, you know, he got me in a positive mindset. I talked about it on the last episode, but, but, uh, you know, uh, I, the cards hit me. In other words, if I had to be focused that day, I was not really sharp. So I just played super tight. I knew I wasn't all there. So when you're, when you're, when you're off a little bit, you could never go wrong playing tighter. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, if, definitely. If you feel like you're off a little bit, tighten up because, uh, I mean, you could go, you, you make could do, mistakes. You could make if you're having days where you're not on and you're miss, it, it, you, dude, and you're and you're not tight, dude. You go, you could go off for big numbers, you know. So got to be careful. All right, yeah. buddy, I gotta go. Have a good hey, one. Thanks for calling, man. You, bro. You take care. And have a happy New Year, man. Peace. Later. You as well. Peace. The mouthpiece. All right, welcome to the mouthpiece, Mr. Norman Chad. How's it going, buddy? I've seen better, I've seen worse. So for all the listeners out there that don't really know you, and they just know you from the World Series of Poker, why don't you kind of tell everybody how you got the gig in the World Series of Poker and how things have kind of evolved over the years? Uh, sure. It was an accident, uh, as is most of my life. <laughs> and at the time that ESPN was going to start doing it a lot, which would have been the moneymaker year, right? Uh, I was doing some consulting work and some on-air work for ESPN, like sports writers arguing like PTI and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And uh, one of them, they were going to bring in a production group that knew nothing about poker to do it independently, 441 Productions. Right. And the guy who hired me at ESPN, he thought I was more of a poker player than I was. So he just asked me to consult with them to help them plan the, the broadcast because they knew nothing about poker. So I did right. that for several months. And then out of nowhere, they called me up after several months. And I'd never even met the producers. We'd just been dealing on conference calls and emails. And they said, uh, "Would you know? have you ever considered being a poker TV commentator? Huh. And I thought huh. it was a joke. I mean, first of all, there was no poker on TV. No. And I remember I made a joke back to him. I said, geez, it's every little boy's dream from the time they're five years old to be a poker TV commentator. You know, <laughs> of course, I want to be a poker TV commentator. It's a ridiculous question. But they said, yeah, we're not going to hire a poker pro for several reasons, including that they're you know unreliable and they're playing in the tournaments. And, you know, so when you make right. us laugh during the conference calls. So and I said, I'll call you back at the end of the week and let you know, because I didn't know whether I was going to say yes or no. Right. Johnny, because I'm an idiot. So, you know, but plus, it was no big deals like one year. Doing poker on TV. What's poker on TV? And that was so that was in that was during marriage number one, two, or three when this happened. That would have been between marriages, uh, which made the decision easier. Uh, that would have been between <laughs> marriages two and three. Yeah. And uh, actually, I still wasn't sure I was going to do it. And then I talked to my best friend back in D.C. and he said, "Why aren't you going to do it?" I said, "I don't know. It's, you know, I mean, you know, it's poker on TV. What the heck is that?" Yeah. He said, "Yeah, but you're forgetting one thing." And I said, "What's that?" He says, "You really don't have a career right now." Yeah. So, yeah good for you. So he was right. So I said yes, and there was seven broadcasts in 2003, seven one-hour broadcasts of the main event. And did so did you and Lon meet through them, or did you know Lon uh, beforehand? No, I'd, we met through them. I did not know Lon. He had done he had done the the poker on ESPN the year before when they did a two-hour final table broadcast when Barconi won. Right, I do uh, remember that. So he yeah. had done it with Gabe Kaplan. Right. Again, afterwards, like post production, how they do it, and mm -hmm. uh, so when they they were going through tapes, and they said, "Okay, we can use him as the play by play guy," and they didn't know who they're going to use as their analyst. So I literally met Lon like a couple of days into the main event that year when he came down. He came down right after I did, so I met him like on day one or two or three of the main event. Oh wow! So uh, we've seen the growth of poker. We've seen the boom, the, mon the money maker boom. We've seen we've seen a lot together. Uh, where do you feel like poker is going 
in the future and or the state of po- televised poker like now? Well, we're in a weird spot now. Right. It's like as far as televised poker goes, mm-hmm. uh, there's like a you know it's almost like a battle for the soul of poker on which direction it should go. Correct. So right. there's my direction, which is almost at some point going to be like you know remember like the silent movies, and then when they moved to talkies, the silent movie actors <laughs> couldn't transition over because they couldn't you know they couldn't act. Right. So I'm like a, I'm like a silent movie poker guy. The the you know the post produced telecast. Mm-hmm. And when they move over to if it's going to be very analytical and strategic and hand strategy, mm-hmm. I'm kind of left behind. I have no I interest in that. Uh, I don't want to do that. Even if I could do that, I wouldn't want to do that. So right now there's there's sort of a you know there's there's a divide in poker that some people think it needs to move to a higher level analytically mm-hmm. to show people the skill level involved and and, and move past you know, what we've done for 15 years. Right. And then others such as myself believe it's, you know, even if you bring in more analysis and strategy, that the heart of the game is the personalities and the characters and Correct. the table talk and all of that, the entertainment value of it. Mm-hmm. And you're really preaching to a small audience if you say, all right, let's go to the metagame. And you just don't, you just don't invite a whole lot more people under the tent that way, a casual person. That's where I stand, but I know a lot of people disagree with me on that. So I, I don't know which way it's going to go. And I, I stand with you. I, I had a long talk with uh, Maury Escondani about it. And um, he agrees with you. Uh, he, unfortunately, you know, uh, like you said, people want to go more towards the live ways. And everybody knows that the edited version are way more entertaining for the casual fan. Uh, the live version is graded as it is for poker nuts like me or 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 all these wizards or analytical people. They want they like that. But guess what? I'm the the people that are watching the main event. These are casual poker fans. Yeah, I think you know both. And by the way, when Antonio's talking the analytics part, he, he does try to make it very. ABC for a casual person. Yeah, he, he might tries, overuse yeah. percentages and and stuff like that to tell people, you know, look, you know, you know, if you start with uh, suited cards, you've got a forty two percent chance of hitting a, you know, a flush draw on right. flop, stuff like that. Yeah. So he he and Tony's got good personality. Yeah, he does. Uh, Jamie also, you know, she's she's going to be very casual. She has great personality. Agree. And I get along with both of them great. Uh, it's 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 the approach that we should take on. ESPN. It's a, a potentially big audience, right? And again, it's not the, the wizards and the analytic people, and it's hard to do. Again, the, the telecasts are too long anyway. The live ones, nobody, yeah. you know, no one would want to sit and watch a baseball game for five or six hours on TV, would they? No. Yeah. So, so our, tel- our live telecasts are too long, but you've got to break it up with, you know, trying to establish the people who are playing to give yourself something to root for, or root against. You're right. a great example of that, Mike. Yeah. You know, in the, in the early years, you're, you're like a, a lightning rod figure. People, they see you at the table, uh, the same thing with Helmuth, uh, and they see you all at the table, and they have an immediate opinion on you because of the way you act at the table. Right. And you're, you, know, you're, you're, you recognize that, and that's why that's so much better for a casual person to watch. It gives them a memory of the telecast. They're not going to remember that some guy you know, made a great play on the turn and floated the, the blah, blah, exactly. and then blocked exactly. the river. They don't remember hands. They remember moments. They exactly. remember moments. They remember you, you remember you in in in, in Shiki. Yeah, you know, they would just remember. You know, they remember people come up and Sam Grizzle. Yeah, yeah it's just, that's the stuff they remember. It's people come up moments. to me at least ten times a year and ask me about that. You know what I mean? Even today, you know, and it's like. They're like, ah, oh, do you hate Shiki? No, me and Shiki are really good friends. That's why the moment was the way it was, because we were such good friends. And because he he was so out of line trying to do something unethical and we were such good friends, that's how it became such a moment in televised poker. you know. But I've kind of grown a little bit where there's not that many bad players in the world anymore, so I think it's better off for me to to just stay focused and not tell them how bad they are because it just makes you look bad. But back in the day before everybody knew how to play, it was, you know, it was fun to make fun of people and it was just fun. I don't know. I still like making fun of people, especially when I'm at the table with Phil, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing better than making fun of Phil, you know, but uh, you know, you're right. And Maury, Maury said the same thing. It's like 
when we did the NBC head up, people didn't understand. This is a television production. It's about people seeing faces that they've seen on TV many a times. They don't want to see just people they've never seen before, not say a word, analytically play correct. That's just not what it's about. And if poker is going to thrive back on television and if it's going to become legalized again back in the U.S., which I, I really believe is going to happen really soon, um, you know, you're go- it's going to – it's not going to – you're not going to always have the best players on the television broadcast, you know. You're trying no, to get on the NBC, you know, the NBC heads up. That's a great example, Mike, mm-hmm. because if, you know, they could have put on if there was a GPI then, you know, mm-hmm. the top 64 GPI players or the top 64 online players, mm-hmm. that would have been ridiculous. Yeah. There's just there's no there was no, there's no call for that. Right. Uh, it was an entertainment product. You right. know, it's it's an you know, it's an artificial NBC heads up national championship and they can you know, they put any sixty four people they want on it and they so they did put people on there who had personality, who who had name recognition. Right. You know, they had a couple of celebrities on there. You know, it just it was for entertainment value and it got a lot more viewership than if you put on sixty four guys named, you know, I flop top pair at uh, full blah blah yeah. dot com. Yeah. You know. <laughs> That's, well, that's what it was, and that's what it should have been. I mean, even like in our in our discussions that me and Maury had, I mean, he even though poker has gone more towards the live stream of the main event, he said if it was up to him, he would he he would cut and do do episodes like we used to do. He said it's just going to be such a way better, more product than the live broadcast where you're you don't you're trying to form a narrative before a narrative is out there. Is that, a, is that the best way to put it? You're trying to... to I don't know, know. The, the best way to put it, but I understand what you're trying to say. Uh, right. What you can do when you do the tape broadcasts in post-production is you can create a narrative because you've, you, know, you have all the stuff in front of you, you see what's happened, and you create a narrative. When right. you're doing it live, you can't form that narrative before it happens. Right. You can try to follow some stories, but it's just you, know, you just have anonymous people coming to the feature table you know, nobody knows 95% of the players at any given time. And so it's just people playing poker and it's really hard to form the narrative as it's, as it's breaking. Right. Right. So, uh, when you, you know, uh, you think back, okay. Uh, I've gotten to know you well. I think you've actually become a pretty good poker player in the split games, which is pretty good to know. And I respect you for that. I remember when you were completely hopeless and you used to sit at our table and we're like, Oh, Lou, we got Norm Chad at our table. <laughs> dead spot, dead spot. But no, you've come a long ways with that. Um, I'm still closer to hopeless than hopeful, but yes, thank you. Do you, do you enjoy playing poker? Uh, yeah, I enjoy playing poker when, you know, when I'm in Los Angeles where I live, mm-hmm. when I'm home and not working, I, I go to the card room at least twice a week. Mm-hmm. I enjoy it, but at the game, the games I play there, which are split pot games, right. I enjoy playing with people and half of them are not poker pros. They're, you know, just right. lawyers, entertaining people. And I enjoy playing with people I know because it feels like a, it feels like a disguised home game. Correct. So I enjoy it when it's recreational. It's fun. You know, we, we do what you do. You, you, you make fun of everybody else. You, mm-hmm. you, 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 people, you know, really well. Uh, I love busting people's chops. It's enjoyable to sit back and play at stakes I'm comfortable at where I'm not going to get crushed even right. if I lose a lot. Uh, so yeah, I do like playing it. Uh, I, I've never liked playing tournaments. Uh, it's just a different atmosphere to me. Me neither. I'm just and, good at them. So I play them, but I've never liked them either. Yeah. I, I respect uh, anybody who yeah. plays tournament poker for a living. They get all my, they get all my respect in the world because it's just, I mean, there's only going to be one person happy at the end of how what three yeah. or four days and the rest are going to be miserable no matter what even if they get second they're going to be like well what if i would have done this and what and then they'll be miserable so like one thing to say is the mixed game players you're gonna analytics cannot teach you how to play mixed games you've got to put in the hours and uh, they're just not analytically driven as they are the no limit hold them in the pot limit omaha you agree Thanks. Thank, oh, thankfully, I agree. I mean, analytics obviously can help you a good, a good degree, but it cannot solve that. It's a different animal. Right. If poker's not social, right. then I, I walk away from it. So that's another part of the game I hate seeing changing, you know, with guys who do come into the card room uh, with their, you know, their, the baseball caps and the headphones on mm-hmm. and, and, and all that. And they just, they don't, they don't interact. Mm-hmm. And if they don't interact, I'm like, I don't want to sit at the table with six autotrons. You know, yeah. I'm there to have a good time. You, you, you beat me, that's fine. But you're not going to beat me without talking to me. Yeah. So just, and, and there's a thing. I, and, 
and you're right. It's bad and, for and business. It's, it's bad, bad for business. For business. They and, don't seem to understand that. And people who listened to the show on the last episode when I had Chad Power on, we talked about that. We talked about the fact that you know when you to get in like we're I'm not a big fan of private games, but unfortunately it's where it's going now and it's really i think it's not good for poker that people could pay double rake and and say who plays and who doesn't play in a game that's in a casino uh I, I, whether i got in the game or not i would still be against it uh but the fact is that i have been getting in games because of my personality um, Phil gets in the games. We know how tight Phil plays, but pe- the thing is, is people want to beat Phil. They'll go out of their way to try and beat Phil in a pot just to watch him go crazy. And so to them, it's totally um, you know, worth it to, to, to play in the games right. with, with like Phil or me or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, he made a good point. This is what I was saying for a long time is I don't, I, I quit grinding every day because I, I hated grinding with miserable people. You know, people that are, like the 8160 game. Yeah, it's a, it's a really lot. It's a great game. But but there's no one more miserable than playing that 8160 mix game. You know, at least when you play like the 2-4 game, uh, you play with people you've been playing with for years. Yeah, a lot of times it's a tough lineup. But the, everybody's having a good time. We're... we're, we're, we're making fun of each other and it's kind of fun, you know. I just I don't like the fact that you you just have to I want to have fun when I play. And and a lot of people are like, "Yes, it's about making money." Yeah, of course it's about making money. But if you said to me, "Would I want to play with three Ralph Perrys in the game or seven Norm Chads in the game?" I mean, I would I would I want to play with people that that make me laugh, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I think that's very important. And not to get listen, me and Ralph get along fine. I wasn't knocking. I was just throwing out a name, by the way. Uh, right. But I'm just, I'm just saying, it's just, it's so important. Where and these kids have got to st- learn that it's not all about making money. It's, not, it is about making money, but it's not. It, sometimes you have to like give up a little EV to put a little smile on somebody's face. You know what I'm saying? They're like, well, I can't give up this much EV, you know, and Chad made a good point about it. He goes, yeah, I get in there. I mix it up. I gamble with them. He goes, because even if I lose, he goes, I lost a hundred thousand in a pot and I started laughing and was joking around with everyone. When you're with people that they see you as a professional lose and, and laugh about it, they're, those are the people that are going to want to play with you again. They don't care that you're better than them. They care that you're showing them a good time. And that is what what I always have strived to do. And it's a lot what Chad's doing now, what Phil's always does. But Phil, Phil does it because he's just, that's just the way he is. You know what I'm saying? He just, <laughs> he, people, he can't help himself. But uh, no, but I go out of my way to make people have a good time and, 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 and a lot of these people that, that don't get in these big poker go games, these juicy poker go games or whatever, they they get insulted. Well, I'm better than him, this guy. I'm one of the best. Why can't I play it? Well, because you don't bring nothing to the table, man. You don't nobody wants to see you not say a word and just just play poker. It's just it's not what's gonna sell subscriptions, you know? That's the best way to put it. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, you talk about how the young guys don't understand this, and you're correct mm-hmm. in general. And I always gave your buddy Daniel Negrano credit on this. Yes. But by the time he was 30, he knew this. Before he was 30, he knew. I've heard him, I used to hear mm-hmm. him talk about that the poker player's got to consider himself an individual businessman. Right. And you've got to do what's right for your business, and part of it is making the customer happy. Yes. So, you know, if they're, they'll, they'll, be, they'll happily give you their money if they have a good time. Yes. And so Daniel understood all the aspects, you know, all the things that were important at the table other than playing good poker. He understood that at a very early age, which I always gave him credit for. Right. And, uh, and it's, you know, so people, you know, love to play with Daniel. They, you know, they'll give Daniel his money. Yeah. Uh, Antonio's great. At, Antonio's great at that, too. Yes. Antonio makes the atmosphere so much fun that he people does. will give him big, big chunks of money at the high high stake games he plays. Yeah, and and I wish I was the the only, the, the difference with sometimes I wish I was more a little bit like Antonio is he's really good at networking. Like he'll 
kiss ass. He'll make everyone feel great in a poker game, you know, to make sure that he gets that invite to that next home game, which is great. You know, I, I think that's great. I'm just not that much of a hustler. I wish I was, you know, if I was, I wouldn't be in the probably ended up in the situation I ended up in, but you know what? Right. You, you got to you learn from your mistakes. Now, I, I've been networking a little bit. I, I'm going. I just opened my Instagram uh, that I'm I'm doing. Uh, even like social media, I I I hated so. I still hate social media. I think like Twitter is like the place where people go to be miserable. It's like if you're in a great mood and having a great day, and you said to your and you want to be a masochist and decide you want to make yourself miserable, go on Twitter. I mean, am I right? I mean, it really is. Uh, you're, you're correct. I, I'm, I'm big. I'm a big proponent of. Often, technology is one step forward, two steps backwards. Dude. Twitter is the perfect example of that. It it's, really is. You know, it's it's obviously it's an unmatched form. It's a worldwide, twenty four seven form where anybody can say anything. Any time. No right. one can censor you, pretty much. But it is such a ba- it's such a bad, toxic place. It's toxic. Overwhelmingly. Right, and you mentioned earlier, Mike. Just uh, you made you made a good point earlier, which is surprising considering your intellectual and educational <laughs> background. Yeah. But you you made a really good point. Uh, just like when you're growing up, like you're in, you're in junior high or high school, you know, people pass notes to each other, and they're you're, they're cool that way. Yeah. And what social media has become, it's that tenfold, twentyfold. It's become public hundred times. Yeah. It's, it's, it, yeah. So it's it's this form that's created, just like Facebook. I mean, Facebook, which is massively successful right essentially makes more people more lonely and more depressed right it's amazing yeah you and know you, if, you, if you know someone unfriends you when you're a kid you, you just you, you go into a, a catatonic yeah. state because you don't have any friends so it's all made it worse it's always there before but it just makes it it's just it's like it's all that stuff on steroids it's yeah. so much worse and it's creating more of a mental illness crisis and i really among think adolescents there, yeah there has to be a way now you know, I was talking to somebody this the other day. I'm like, well, can't they just like I, I made a point like uh, when I was like 14, we went over to the we were, we're all hanging out. And this girl like her parents were out of town. And they pull out the the um, the v, the v, VHS uh, porn tapes. Right. And we're like sneaking around now and that we're 14. I mean, now the kids nine, eight, seven, they could just click on any porn site on the internet now the, granted they they say like well par- parental control you could give your kid a cell phone and you could block it and there's nothing they could do well th- that's a good parent how about all their friends that are not good parents you see and then they're all sneaking around and do not that's just not healthy for a kid who's eight nine ten years old and shit it wasn't even healthy for me when i was 14 well it was funny but you know uh it's just these are things that I, I really think there has to be a way to either monitor a certain amount of hours per week on the internet, and if you if you work on the internet through your computer, you could put in a uh, a disclaimer for more hours. But there has to be a way to make people leave their house, go out, socialize. Uh, I mean, even when tweets or not tweets, but texting first came out, I'm like. Why would I want to text with somebody? I want to talk to somebody. And the, sure enough, now it's like most of the time it's you're, tw- you're texting with people because it's just more convenient. And again, the, the lack of social interaction causes depression. Uh, they were, you know, they were saying that, that this generation uh, is, is reproducing at like 29% level less than uh, it used to be. So yeah, that's the one thing you can't do online. Yeah. And uh, but you're again, you're absolutely right about us sort of retreating uh, into our boxes and there's zero social interaction. And that was happening. By the way, people would have complained about that when the radio came out. I remember and people, you know, think, think pre-radio. You, you're, you're at home at night. Uh, unless you're reading, you're talking with each other. So right. when the radio came out, all you do is sit around and listen to the radio. So you're not really not interacting. And, and then television was the radio on steroids. Television was much worse in terms of pulling people away from social interaction. Right. And then the internet is, I mean, internet includes television. Right. I mean, television was a game changer. The internet is, is a stratospheric game changer. Right. I mean, look uh, at all these streaming services that are opening up. There's like, like, it's like 
Duck Duck Goose Streaming Service, Norman Chad Mike the Mouth Streaming Service. Uh, everybody's got a streaming service. It's like I just I just want to say, Mike, that uh, you know I carved it out four and a half hour period tonight to talk about poker, bowling, and marriage. Right. And uh, in the first hour of this, it's been mental illness and Buddhism, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I had to switch yeah. it up on you, man, since I I, I just knew that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you would expect, and I'd have to throw a curveball at you. You know what I mean? Okay, Norm. So listen, what were your some of your favorite character stories uh, to commentate on? I did prefer talking about the internet. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Uh, no, the, <laughs> uh, no, have the, you looked? At, the, the, think the, the, I know there's so many, but if you go back over the years, like, yeah. like. No, yeah, so no, I've I've always told people that my favorite part of the main event mm-hmm. is, is is first of all during the main event meeting so many people who come there from all over the country and all over the world and you know some of them have so many interesting stories. So in the greatest part of when the main event gets televised is when you have any version of the Everyman and it starts with Chris Moneymaker of course right. getting down to that final table. Right. So of all the everymen we've had get down there, and we've had Chris, you know, we've had great people like Chris Moneymaker and, and Dennis Phillips. Right, the one that. who's just is, is like a mystery to me because he just came out of the woods one year. He finished second, and then he went back to the woods. Oh, Darwin, Darwin Moon, Darwin Moon, right? Is that who you're talking about? <laughs> it gets no better than than Darwin Moon. Absolutely, so no, so made that final table, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. That's still live a year. That, so yeah, that, Darwin was just a great character, and uh, and we even caught him on camera lying to his wife because he, you know, he went over, you know, he he had a hand and he went over to the rail to talk to his wife, and he lied to her what his hand was. I didn't know you lied to your wife about your hand. I know you lied to other poker players, but Darwin was just <laughs> just a wonderful guy to watch. That, and he said he wouldn't come back, you know. And I saw him the day after the main event. I saw him at the uh, front desk of the Rio when uh-huh. he was checking out. And I talked to him for about three minutes, and he mentioned, I said, see you next year. He said, I don't know about that. I think he came <laughs> back once, all right? One, one I other think time. once. He just, he says, you know. Such a nice I mean, he guy. He made a big, a big windfall, and he knew what he wanted, and he just, you know, he didn't like that, that, that atmosphere, and he just, he just went back to the, to his home in Western you Maryland know, or West Virginia. I remember, that was the year Joe Cata won it. And, like, I watched Joe Cata yeah. two years ago. This guy was the best player at the final table. And then, I mean, when he won that main event, I, I ripped him. I'm like, the guy played like dog shit. Like he for, just kept four betting everybody with, and he, he th- three times at the final table, he four bet shoved an under pair versus an over pair and hit a set. You know what I mean? And, right. and the, people don't, a lot of people don't realize this final table. The very first hand ahead of dealt. If fucking Darvin Moon mo- re raises all in, Cata calls and Darvin Moon wins the championship. Unless he hits a nine when the Queens versus nines. That was the very first hand dealt at the head up. People don't, oh, even I don't remember, remember that. that. I remember yeah. that that was a hand. I don't remember that was It was the, first the very hand yeah. first hand dealt at the final uh-huh. head up match. If Darvin Moon re raises him after he gets three bet all in, we have a different world champion and history is written differently. So, you know, I, we always like to talk about history in poker and how one card changes not only the person's fortunes in the poker world, but their spot in history in the poker world. If Chris Ferguson doesn't hit the nine on the river against TJ Cloutier in 2000, does Chris Ferguson ever become what he became? Who knows? We, you know, he didn't have much money at the time. Maybe, probably not. You know, does the whole yeah, full, never know. does full and, tilt uh, ever even get born? Like he did create the software for full tilt. Matter of fact, I remember in people. I tell these people a story all the time because it's just one of the many things why I didn't get rich. In 1998, I remember Chris Ferguson says, "Mike, give me twenty thousand. I'm going to give you fifty percent of this." Um, software i'm creating I, I, i'm like uh for what he goes for internet poker and i was like well, what's the internet i didn't even know what the internet was when he had approached me about that just give me twenty thousand, we'll go halves 50 percent, whatever like my god i mean just to tell you 
what could have been for me. But no, I had I can, I look back at all the mistakes I've made. It's always because of sports betting or whatever. But luckily for me, I fixed that problem. I mean, I mean, it's seven years too late, but whatever. Well, that's a, a, a problem that has only one way to be fixed. <laughs> uh, and as I always tell people, do not bet sports. But they don't listen to me. Yeah. But you also just remind me, Mike, that that there's, there's an incredible equivalent in sports betting and poker. Poker players, as you know, uh, remember their worst bad beats with incredible detail about right. how the hand went out. And sports betters remember their worst bad beats. Uh, <laughs> with I remember same detail. Well, I no do this, how I do, long ago it was. Yeah, I do the same. But I also remember the times I've gotten lucky, which is very far and few between, because. You know, I'm always getting my money in ahead, but there is, you know, I, there's a couple of times I, I mean, like I don't win the tournament of champions. I mean, the one hand that Hoyt got played a hand different and I fell for it after we, you remember the tournament of champions, we played eight hours, three handed, one of the greatest three handed televised poker of all time. Yeah, and, a lot uh, of fun. and it was, and, and it was unbelievable and, and how, and I stayed focused for so long for so long, but if I don't hit the queen on the turn, he can end up having ace king on ace queen. And then when he hits the queen, he still has like a gutter ball, a king or a diamond. So he had 15 cards to still hit with one to come. And I win that and I go on to win the tournament of champions. I mean, you're talking about me finishing possibly third for 250,000 and winning a million. Right. And, I, I remember that, you know. Now, see, you remember all that stuff. I'll tell you something you don't remember. Mm-hmm. You likely don't remember. And I don't remember the year. This is, would have been like 05 or 06. And I, actually, early on, when I first got into poker with 03, with the ESPN, we, we didn't get along that well. We mm-hmm. didn't get along at all. Uh, and I didn't get along with Helmuth either. Like, mm-hmm. I, I used to, whatever I said about you all on the air, and then I came to appreciate both of you, mm-hmm. and you all have been better with me as well. So, yeah, we, we, we did not get along early on. And I was wandering the main event, and this would have been like 05 or 06, mm-hmm. could have been 07, but sometime early on, you had done a lot of TV time. Mm-hmm. And I was somewhere in the Amazon room, and you shouted out my name from like five tables away, like you stood up at the table and went, Norman Chad! <laughs> and as I walked towards you, as you continued standing, you went into about a 30-second diatribe about this guy just kills me on TV. This, he, you call me a lot of names <laughs> uh, that I won't repeat here. This guy is just ridiculous. He says, I'm this and this and this, and he doesn't know who I am, and he's just full of shit, and blah, 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 blah. He just went off for about 30. By the way, you're not the first person to do that. Only three or four people. I don't remember it, but I remember, I do remember, I, think, yeah. I, did, I did not like the things you were saying about me because you didn't yeah. know me as a That's person. That's what you were talking about. Yeah. You, so, and, and then people ask me, what would you say in response? And I, I always have the same response, by the way. Uh, I didn't say anything. I just took it. And I always tell people, listen, I got the biggest form in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got millions of people who are watching on ESPN. Right. So I got to give somebody their, do- their give them their day. If they're going to, you know, tear me down you yeah. know, in, in whatever setting it is, I got to give them the form. I mean, because I got a bigger form. So, yeah, I didn't come back at you and say, you know, just, you know, try to outwit you. I just took it all in and I yeah. said well, virtually nothing. You know, I don't remember. But you really ripped me a new asshole. I, 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 didn't I don't, remember, I, I don't remember. I ago. do remember attacking you and I remember what it was about, but I don't remember what I said or anything. But it had to do with, I remember it completely, was you were, it was something to do with when I got set up and got put in jail and then you were saying something that was not factual about it on, oh. on the broadcast. It and so that's what got me that so That would be upset. bad if I said something that wasn't factual. That right. Get you upset. It, it was what. But it was like the narrative that was going around, but the okay. people in the inner circles of poker knew what the truth was. And when you had repeated it, okay. that's when I had gotten upset. And I remember, I do remember okay. uh, yelling at you about it, but I don't remember, you know, like you said, it, the whole okay. thing. But, you know, over the years, you know, it's come, I've come to appreciate you as what you've done for poker. And, um, you know, many people like to say, ah, uh, the norm and lawn their 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 days run its course uh we need to get new people in there i mean you've heard that a million times and I, I will always stick up for the fact that you don't understand what they bring to the table it's a once a year thing where it's just your yours and lawn's chemistry i don't know how to put it but it's kind of like me and phil Helmuth's chemistry when we're playing in the same game together uh mm-hmm. there's a lot of good energy and a lot of fucked up energy that comes off of it, but it all comes out right. I mean, I, no, it sounds like a compliment, so I'll take it. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, it, it, it's it's I, just you guys, I could not imagine 
the World Series main event being broadcast without you alone. It would just, I just would feel there's emptiness there. I'm sure. We still love doing it, and I do appreciate that. You know, a lot of things like I, I, you know, I, I look back. I remember. I remember the time we we did the bull outside, and I went flying off in two seconds, and you outlasted <laughs> me, and I had to live. With, I had to live with that for like a whole year. Then the time when when you were, when, you, were when, you were off that bull like in a second. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and we then the and here's the funny part. Then when I pulled my bowling balls out, we did the bowling ball segment in about, I think it was 2010, right? And I get... Yeah, we uh, did the Gulf Coast. Dude, and I bowl like crap, and all I kept saying is my... No, I kept saying my back is killing me. Something's not right here. And as it ends oh, up, I had the injury. That ends up being true. Yeah, the injury was from two years ago, and that's why right. whenever I was whenever I was bowling, my when up my back it just felt something felt off you know and then i i, I look back at it now norman is and I, I i love this i say this a lot because i really want the listeners to understand nobody should ever portray themselves as a victim you must be a victor in this world to be successful and for three and a half years after my injury i blamed everybody I fucking even blamed the man upstairs, and which was the worst thing I ever did. And, and you know, things got worse and worse and worse until I was able to, to, to own up to, hey, this is what you're dealing with. This is what you're stuck with. You need to stop feeling sorry for yourself. You need to make your best out of your life. And ever since that, and I got, the, I bought into the Daniel Negreanu, Phil Helmuth, positivity, and I really bought into it. I am a big believer in it, by the way, and nobody will ever change my mind. And even now, who Phil, who got me convinced about this positivity, when he starts calling me and, and going on these negative rants, I say, Phil, what happened to positivity? I don't want to hear about it anymore. It's a, this is not you. Stay positive. And that's how I get him back on the straight and narrow when he grenades a pot or whatever. You know. But it's so important in this world. You must live life every day like it's your last. You can't think of negative things that happened the day before. And you must try and stay in a positive mindset. And if you do that... Even when things do get bad, if you're able to tell yourself this, it allows you to fight through the bad times. And, you know, I mean, this is like shit coming out of me. You Six years ago, you just what wasn't going to hear from me. You know what I mean? I didn't want to hear about uh, yeah, would, these things. You know, I, and I've learned a yeah, lot. Yeah, actually, today, as it turns out, again, your last few minutes, right. I was at my therapist, my weekly therapy today, yeah. and I should pay you more. For the there last you go. five minutes, then I paid him today for 50 minutes. Yeah, you probably got more uh, therapy yeah, out of me. What you're talking about the last few minutes is absolutely correct. Yeah. No, it, it now, is. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to criticize my therapist, no, but yeah, it's, everything it's, you're talking about is absolutely correct. Listen, if you start festering how unlucky you are, because I remember back in, uh, this was before, because yeah, 2008 was my big year. That was when I lost all the weight and I got, and I was po got uh, real positivity that year. Everything was really good. Where the year before, I was crying to everybody. I'm the unluckiest player in poker. Nobody's unluckier than me. No one's unluckier than me. And you know what? If you tell yourself you're the unluckiest player, no one's, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be unlucky. Now, is there times you're going to stay positive that you're going to get unlucky? Sure. But if you keep that mindset of it's my time, it's my time, yes, I'm going to win this tournament, you're, it's, it's just such a better place to be than – how many times have you like seen at the t final table like they the all in call? One guy guy's got queens, the other guy's got ace key. The guy with queens picks up, puts he's fifty six percent, but he picks up, puts his jacket on, picks up his backpack like he know he's gonna lose, right? And then he loses and he wants to know why. Like people say, well, if he didn't do that, you think the cards would be any different? Well, probably not, but you know what? In the future, they might be. In, I, I in just, one, any one instance, of course, that should have no bearing. Right. And he, he, try to explain this to me, because this is what makes no sense to me. And you're actually, again, telling me something that a blackjack dealer that I started accidentally dating between marriages uh, about 20 years ago taught me, because she, she, uh, she would be dealing to me, and she said, you know, every time you get dealt 19, 
And the dealer has ten. You go. I know you're going to turn over a ten underneath there. You know you're right. going to you're going to have twenty. Right. And she kept. She she's the one who said the same thing you're telling me. If you keep thinking the dealer's going to beat you, the dealer's going to have an improbable. You know, make an improbable five card twenty one to beat your twenty. Right. It's going to happen. Absolutely. And I said that's important. But she's absolutely right. And it makes no sense rationally. Right. Because you can't change the cards. But why is this correct? Because this is correct. Because there is something about the positivity. Or if you think something bad is going to happen. It increases the chances it will happen. I agree. I agree. And, and vice versa. That's why, you know. So that, it, should, that should be true generally in life, but how is that even true at the table where it is true? Yeah. So. Anyways, listen. So we got, uh, I put out a bunch of people to call in and ask you questions. Uh, I'm going to play the voice. Uh, I have no idea what they are. And we'll, uh, and you can answer them and see what they have to say. All right. All right, Danny, play them, buddy. Hey, Mikey, uh, first-time caller, long-time fan, uh, big fan of Norm and Chad as well. This is Jeff calling from Chicago. Uh, quick question for Norman. Uh, you know, I think you're one of the funniest, if not the funniest, uh, poker commentators uh, I've ever watched. And uh, my question is, how much of the jokes and one-liners and – you know, just general entertainment that you provide throughout a telecast. How much of that do you write and how much of that is written ahead of time? Um, obviously, your delivery is terrific. I'm just curious if, if you're writing these terrific bits or if they um, are somehow written for you and you're just delivering them. Thanks a lot, guys. Look forward to the answer. That was a good question. Was- yeah, actually, so on the on the, the tape telecast, which we have done since the beginning, mm-hmm. uh it's it's changed over the years. So in the first few years, almost, and because I wanted to have a live feel for it, and uh, I wanted to just, you know, that that's what we're trying to go for anyway, that we're actually there doing it and fooling the viewer. I Almost everything was off the top of my head. When we, you know, we'd get the broadcast beforehand, and I'd take some notes a couple of days beforehand, but we'd go into the studio, 80 or 90% of what I said was just coming off the top of my head, just like you would if you're watching a basketball game and doing the play-by-play of the commentary. And then it sort of transitioned through the years for several reasons where it almost went to the other extreme now on the last few years of the post-produced telecast Mm -hmm. where I end up uh, essentially, for lack of a better term, scripting like 80 or 90 percent of what I'm going to say beforehand. Uh, And it makes so much more sense from a a quality standpoint, a time standpoint, a money standpoint, every standpoint. It makes more sense. And plus they ended up rerunning, you know, they ended up rerunning these main event telecasts ad nauseum over the years. And so, you, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be just working off the cuff. If they're going to be showing them 50 or 100 times more, you want to make sure that moment is correct. So I went from mostly, you know, whatever you want to call it, yeah. off the top of the head improv, to mostly writing my own stuff over the last few years. I wish I had a writing staff because I ran out of stuff about 10 years ago. <laughs> but uh, almost everything I say is produced by my, uh, you know, my own head or my own pen. Uh, once in a while, uh, a producer or two, uh, Dan Gotti or a Zach Ralston, will make suggestions on stuff that I might want to say that is terrific, and I'll use that. But 95% of it's my own stuff. Well, that's, that's, that's something I didn't even know. So, uh, you know, you, to me, you And then it's time. tough for us on, on live. It's a different animal where you can't do that type of preparation. It's just stuff that's happening right there. Right. And so that's a whole different animal, which I, I enjoy doing. But that's where you, again, just get to talk off the top of your head again. We're just wheeling and dealing, which, you know, I like to do. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's fun to do that. Yeah, if you did it so, back in the yeah, day, both, you, both, are, both are different. If you, if you would have wrote the stuff back in the day, you wouldn't have called me a, a, a drug, a drug dealing, whatever you fucking called me <laughs> that I went crazy on you for. Anyways, make sure you edit that, Danny. Danny, edit that. Okay. Uh, anyways, okay. Let's, uh, let's hear it the next one. Hi, this is a uh, question for Norman Chad. Uh, this is Matt from Washington, long-time listener, first-time caller. Uh, Mr. Chad, I'm curious, and I would love your uh, uh, thoughts as a, as a semi-professional broadcaster uh, about a situation that uh, has become aware to me and how you, know, you would handle it. Um, I've been involved in, and have a good friend of mine who uh, – Occasionally does some, some broadcasting, television, radio, et cetera, webcasts and such. Um, and hypothetically, if this person ever had an opportunity to be on national television, 
uh, and wanted to take a bounty out on me in the World Series main event, that would be kind of a douchey thing, don't you think? Friends don't do that to friends. And I'm curious what you think in terms of the code of ethics of broadcasting about uh, publicly uh, taking a, a bounty out and uh, uh, wishing ill upon uh, a good friend. Thanks for taking the call. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay. That well, what is this, CS, CSI Broadcasting? <laughs> Wait a minute. Who is this douchebag? <laughs> Dude, was that Matt Brooks? I hope it is, because first of all, he called me a semi-professional broadcaster, which is, I guess, an insult. Uh, <laughs> second off, that was Matt Brooks. He said, yeah, Matt from Washington. You know, uh, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of yours. Who this he year sounded familiar, so... The, the, you know, uh, on the main event telecast, and the only reason I made this 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 political operative hack a bounty <laughs> is because he kept asking me who I started a thing when we went live a few years ago where I'd have uh, my uh, what did I call them my uh, surprise picks or my my sneak my sneak peeks or who's going to go Deep, far each right. day who who I'm going to pick. Right. Uh, so he wanted to be one of those. He wanted me to select him. <laughs> And I got so t- I was never going to select him. I got so tired that one day I said, "Listen, I'm never going to make you one of my picks, but I will put a bounty on your your lame ass head." And so I put a bounty on him. And then he got more notoriety than he will in 25 years of doing his 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 dirty tricks, political operative hack stuff. And now he's complaining. So I'll, you know, I'm glad I put a bounty on him. I'm glad the guy took him down. Oh, Where did that's get fucking people? funny, man. That's so funny. Oh my God, I, lo- I love Matt, man. He's a good guy, good people. All right, let's see. Our- <laughs> let's see what else we have. Let's hear. Yo, Mikey, what's up? It's Frank from Georgia. So I had a question for Norman. Uh, so have you been married twenty five times, uh, <laughs> truly in real life, like you see all the time doing your commentary, or um, is that just to make us laugh? And uh, if it's true, I'm sorry. <laughs> and. Uh, I guess for you, Mike, how you been running and shit, um, last two episodes have been really good, bro. Good luck with the show, keep up the good work, and um, give me a holler back whenever you get some time, man. I got some more questions for you, I just can't. All right. Well, what do you think, bud? Yeah, on the marriage front, you know, I've used creative license over the years. I've never said 25. Yeah, that, uh, I've never I might have that. said as high as five, mm-hmm. uh, but I've never said 25. Yes, in real life, uh, I was married... Uh, I'm into my third and final marriage. Yes. Uh, I was married very young. Uh, we got divorced after several years. I then was married for a cup of coffee uh, about 20 years ago, uh, a mistake on my part. And now I got married again in 07. Mm-hmm. So that's been 12, more than 12 years of somewhat marital bliss, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You would call it less blissful than I would. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been three marriages. I'm, I'm one for three, which is a good batting average if you're a baseball player. <laughs> It and sure the one is. for three could always turn to 0 for three. I mean, any morning I wake up and ask her, are we good to go for another day? And one day she's going to say no, and I'll go to 0 for three, and, but I will not be getting married again. Okay. Uh, this is still death to us part. I, I think so. You sounded like you said you were pretty happy, and like I guess uh, we'll have to put her on the podcast and make sure that she's just as happy as you, buddy. All right, next one. Yes, Norman Chad. This is J. Period Kirby Smith from Southeast Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I, if I may say, have always truly liked and actually loved at times your specific type of sense of humor. The way you see things, your your little quips you have during a poker tournament, the things you say about the players, I always thought it was kind of a gentle humor, if you will, and it's rather witty at times. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is there are, have been people throughout my life who have thought my way of looking at things and my humor is a little bit, I don't I should, I want to say abstract, but they think it's like, a, well, at times goofier than hell. So therefore, I'm wondering if my opinion of you, albeit positive, is legitimate. Um, I've, I've enjoyed some of the things, some of your gentle comments about Phil Helmuth, for instance, when he erupts and, um, you're, like one time he said something about uh, a, a guy was <laughs> something about a guy was uh, an idiot from Northern Europe or something, and you said uh, about another player when Helmut criticized that this guy must be from a bad place, like this guy or something. It was just funny, so I just thought I'd comment, give you a little credit. But I wonder if you're the kind of guy that would actually give an autograph. Could you, are you approachable? Also, thank you. 
Oh. Oh. Kirby's Kirby's one of my more quirky fans, I think. Yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah. I, I, as far as I don't know if whatever my humor is is it, it's it's whatever I do naturally, so it, it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. I'm not trying to uh, make it work for everybody. I just do whatever comes out naturally. So. Again, sometimes it's an acquired taste, and some people never acquire it, and that's the way it is. Uh, but yeah, I tend to be self-deprecating and self-effacing, but I have a lot of reasons to be self-deprecating and self-effacing. I used to tell people I was George Costanza before George Costanza, uh, a <laughs> loser in just almost every regard of my life, professionally, personally, and financially. So that's the way that works. And uh, as far as how it goes, uh I mean, I always, I always just tell Phil that I should kick back part of my salary to him because he makes it so easy. He so, does. He's you know, somebody, he's somebody Phil, easy to pick on. You know, Phil's a character. He says stuff, and then you just react to it. And the stuff that comes out of Phil's head is as good as anything I've ever heard. <laughs> you, again, you can't script it any better. So I've always enjoyed, you know, when, when, when Phil or Daniel or Mike are on, it's just much easier. We don't have to do as much. <laughs> and then they're great to react to. And Phil is number one. And, and be, you know, when you react to mm-hmm. Phil, there's no one close yeah. He's the best person to react to. I agree, and uh, yeah, you could. Uh, as far as autographs, also, he's very approachable. Just, oh, just yeah. Uh, actually, I don't seem approachable, which I don't. I don't blame people. Uh, that goes back to college people when I was with, uh, an editor at my college newspaper, and they direct people to the back of the newsroom. You got to talk to that guy if you want to become a writer here. They'd look at me from like fifteen feet away and go, "No, okay, I don't want to talk to that guy. Who else can I talk to?" Yeah. I don't look that approachable, but yes, I am. Uh, when you do approach me, I'm friendly enough. And I will do any uh, photograph or autograph uh, that you wish. Even though, again, I've always been amazed, Mike, with, again, with Negrano when he's doing it, when he's playing at the World Series, and he goes up to the rail, and he's giving out autographs between yeah. hands. And I just couldn't do that. I mean, I, I have enough trouble focusing on the table, and I don't even know what I'm yeah. doing. And, he, I, uh, you know, to, 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 to walk around and deal with people between hands just sort of amazes me. All right, Norman. Well, man, thanks for the interview. Uh, it was great. Really great talking to you, and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you in uh, D.C. I heard you uh, might be uh, uh, dealing our private poker game. I'm going to be dealing your uh, exclusive private poker game, and when we're in D.C., I'm, uh, I'm going to actually give you $160. I'm canceling my therapy session next week, and I'm just going to give you the money. That's it, baby. And uh, you earned it. All and right. uh, might as well go to you into some uh, instead of some uh, Malibu doctor who doesn't need it. Man, you're the best, Norman. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Have a great night. All right. Talk to you soon. Later. Bye-bye. The Mouthpiece. I hope you enjoyed episode 32, year two, 2020 of The Mouthpiece. This is going to be a big year for us in poker with the podcast, with our YouTube channel, with everything. Positivity, positivity, positivity. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of The Mouthpiece. Happy New Year, everybody. We'll see you next week on The Mouthpiece. The Mouthpiece.